So, Drew, the second week of the college football season just wrapped up, and by far the biggest game was uh, Colorado hosting the Nebraska Cornhusters. Both coaches in their first year. Obviously, Matt Rule, a prestigious college coach, went and tried out in the NFL, and it didn't work out. So he's back in college at Nebraska, and everybody knows the story about Coach Prime. Um, Drew, first things, what were the biggest things to you about that game? I know that was by far the biggest game most people watched uh, this past Saturday. And, uh, you know, a lot of people have a lot of different opinions. You know, you got a lot of casuals saying that Colorado is, you know, the next big team. You know, you, you got a lot of people that are saying Colorado is still not going to be worth much this year. So, so what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, this game was really hyped up. It, the result wasn't what a lot of people expected it to be. Um, a lot of people were looking at this game, and then Alabama and Texas was another big game. But this watching both these teams play, Colorado was just the better team. And, you know, it wasn't really surprising after what we saw last week um, versus what they did against TCU. Colorado is looking much improved, and we talked about it in the podcast video that our biggest thing that we wanted to see with Colorado is – we weren't expecting them to win games, but we just wanted to see them compete. And they have by far ex- exceeded expectations. Um, Colorado played a really good game, and, but in the same breath, too, I, I'm not taking anything away from Colorado. Nebraska is absolutely terrible. Uh, Jeff Sims, transfer quarterback from Georgia Tech, the, he's just not good. I, I don't know how else to put it. In the, in, I can't be more nice when I say that. Um, he just looked lost, and not, it wasn't just him. The whole Nebraska team as a whole was just having blunder after blunder. It just looked like old Nebraska teams um, in the previous years. I know it's Matt Rule's first year. I know it's going to take time for him to get his players in and to really turn this program around. But similar to Colorado, I wanted to see Nebraska maybe not win a lot of games. I don't know if that would really be their goal coming off all these terrible seasons, but I wanted to see them compete in these games, and Nebraska just couldn't do it. Uh, a lot of times shooting themselves in the foot, missing field goals, fumbling the ball. They, I mean, they did have success running the football, but Jeff Sim, he's just not the answer at quarterback, and I just don't know what else Nebraska has in the quarterback room to really take his spot. And maybe I, if Jeff Sims is the best quarterback on that team, I can't see Nebraska having a better than a 3-9 season. He, he just played absolutely terrible. But, again, in the same breath, you got to give Colorado credit. They played a really good game. Yeah, Jeff Sims, uh, he has the most turnovers over any active player in college football. And, you know, he showed why that's the case against Colorado. Multiple drop snaps. I feel like maybe it was the pressure they got to him. But, you know, needless to say, you're right. He did not perform well. I thought Nebraska's defense played uh, pretty well. I think mm-hmm. that Nebraska running the ball really well, like you mentioned, and um, – Their defense playing well is going to show you how these teams are going to start adapting to Colorado and getting film on Colorado. We saw week one against TCU that uh, TCU was having success running straight up the middle. Colorado's defense is too soft in the middle. We saw that again against Nebraska. Nebraska was running the ball at will. The only problem when you have a a quarterback like Jeff Sims, and not to mention Nebraska has zero receivers. They're trying out defensive backs at receivers. They, they, They need somebody out there to help out Jeff Sims in that offense, and they just can't do it. So it's a combination of just not having the guys on the offensive side. But with that run game, you have to be playing with the lead. You can't be, you know, leaning on the run game two and clock whenever you're playing from behind. And Colorado's offense did a great job. You know, they were stalling out for a minute. But towards the end of the first half and then going on into the second half, they did a great job of putting the pace on Shadur Sanders. He, he didn't look as good as he did week one. He still had a great game. That offensive line is going to have to protect him. Nebraska did a pretty good job of, you know, getting some pressure on Shadur Sanders, and that's, you know, giving me a little cause for concern uh, with this Colorado O-line because the Pac-12 is dominant this year. You know, there's a plethora of ranked teams that are in the uh, – plenty of the teams in the uh, Pac-12 are ranked, and Colorado is going to have to play all those teams. It's going to be a tough stretch for them, and some of those teams have great pass rushers, a great front seven. Uh, Colorado's O line is going to have to be able to uh, you know, keep Shadir safe. Yeah, and Colorado, they already have two wins of the season. And like you said, the Pac 12 is really good. I don't know how many teams total they have in the top 25. I want to say it's eight or nine right now, which is absolutely unreal. Colorado has a rough stretch of games coming up. Even if they still go four and eight for the rest of the season, I think Colorado is a much improved team. Um, and I think they're going to be able to compete with a lot of these top teams in the Pac-12. I mean, they're ranked for a reason. And, and you know, Colorado's going to get a lot of hype moving forward. I think they play Colorado State next. And then they play a, a big one uh, against Oregon, which, you know, college game day could very well be there. Um, so we'll, we'll really see what Colorado is all about when they start getting into the heat of the conference schedule. And one thing one thing about Oregon, you know, Oregon just lost a close game or won a close game to Texas Tech. Mm-hmm. You know, and they were behind, you know, late in the fourth quarter in that game. They didn't look, you know – outstanding but 
Oregon has a dominant run game, okay? They are going to run the ball in various ways and, and, and establish dominance in that sphere of the game. I do not see Colorado beating Oregon for that very reason. Uh, I think that their offense is super high-powered, but when you play – a, a team like Oregon that's going to run the ball, control the clock, and they're not going to – their defense is not going to let them get so far behind where they have to abandon the run game. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be Colorado's first true, true test. They've already blown my expectations out of the water, but I'm still – I went from saying four to five wins at the beginning of the season. Now I'm at, yeah, at five, six. I'd be surprised mm -hmm. if they get seven. I think the over-under is like seven and a half, so I'm obviously on the under on that. But Oregon's going to be the first true test for that team. And and obviously it's going to be a test for Oregon, too, to see if they can come out of the Pac-12 because the Pac-12 is super competitive this year. Moving on, the, the biggest other game by far, this one did meet expectations a little more, um, you know, in comparison to the height. But Alabama-Texas, obviously Texas got the win 34-24 to at Bryant-Denny Stadium. This is Alabama's first loss since 2019 at home um, since LSU and Joe Burrow came in. Uh, with an exciting game there. But this is another interesting fact. Nick Saban, this is his first loss at home by double digits as a, a college coach ever, uh, which is absolutely insane. So, you know, Texas made history by doing that and just coming in and beating, beating Alabama at Brian Denny is a, you know, a miracle in itself because a lot of teams just simply can't do it. But, Aiden, you know, we talked about it. Alabama had their problems heading into the season. And everyone knew this. This wasn't a secret. Everything that happened in this game that caused Alabama to lose were question marks heading into this season. So, you know, diving deeper into it, what exactly did we see that let Alabama lose this game? Well, first off, it's, it was the quarterback play. You know, their quarterback missed on some throws. Milro did not have an extraordinary game. But also, the, the root of the whole problem for the Alabama team was that they got dominated up front on both sides of the ball. Um, Texas had five sacks and nine tackles for loss against uh, Alabama. That you, you just can't have that, especially when your quarterback already isn't a great thrower. His rhythm's already going to be a little off. He's already going to be a little bit antsy in the pocket. And then you add on five sacks later, imagine how he's feeling. So that was the whole thing. Uh, Alabama's tackles did not do a good job against the pass rushers for Texas. I mean, true freshman, I forget his name for Texas, number zero defensive end. That guy's going to be a monster. That's just his second game playing college football against Alabama, and he had an amazing game. The linebackers for Texas, you know, both you know, both NFL draft prospects, these guys are going to be great. Texas is a great team. There's no secret that they've had the talent. They almost won last year at Texas with Quinn Ewers not playing the whole entire game. You know, Alabama just skated out of that game with a field goal. And I've been hearing a lot of Alabama fans talk about – uh, Alabama's done, you know, this, that, and the third. Look, like I just said, Alabama skated out of that game last year with the field goal. They go on, they lose to Tennessee, and they go on, they lose to LSU. So Alabama has not been, you know, the prestigious Alabama that we've known growing up since last year, okay? Does that mean that they're regressing and that they're falling off? No, I just think that they're remaining stagnant when these other teams are continuously getting better. Now, when I look at Alabama, they're still number one in recruiting this past year. They're probably going to be top two in recruiting next year. Like, this isn't going to change. Nick Saban has not forgotten how to coach. When he has a problem, he's going to address it. This is only the second week of the season. Do I think that they're going to go on and, and, and come out of the SEC? No, I think they could definitely come out and win the West. But I do not see them, you know, beating Georgia in the SEC championship this year because – you know, this isn't like past years where they've been able to have a dominant offense and a great defense. They're going to have to be playing from ahead if they want Milro to, you know, be able to have su some success because it all comes off running the ball and the quarterback run game and the play action and sitting on the ball with the lead. And uh, this isn't the same high-powered offense that they've been able to rely on with Milro. Yeah, and one of the most concerning things for me moving forward is uh, Jalen Milrose, Alabama's leading rusher right now. Now, in week one, he was the leading rusher, but it was a little bit of a different story because, you know, it was the first game against Middle Tennessee. They were probably rotating a, a bunch of backs. Um, so, you know, moving into the Texas game, I was like, all right, so a running back's going to have to step up. Jalen Milrow can't be the leading rusher. Alabama's simply not going to win. I know what Jalen Miller can do with his feet. He's absolutely electric. When he gets the ball in open space, he can run uh, with, with the best of them. But Alabama's going to have to find a running back that can, that can win them the game. Uh, Jace McClellan, and it's not all his fault. I know, like you said, the Texas defensive front was just dominating the Alabama offensive front. So it wasn't just the running back play. But Jace McClellan's not a Najee Harris. He's not one of those iconic Alabama running backs. 
Um, he, he's just very average. And that's very concerning because if Alabama gets in a situation where they can't run the ball and you're forcing Jalen Milrow to throw the ball, uh, it's just not it's not good for Alabama. I mean, that's literally a recipe for disaster. Milrow is good at throwing the deep ball. He can do that. But anything intermediate, anything short, he just can't do it. Um, any lick of pressure, he's running for his life. Uh, that's a whole other thing in itself. Uh, he has absolutely no pocket patience whatsoever. So if Alabama ever finds a situation where they can't run the ball and there's a team they're playing uh, that's disrupting their offensive line and getting to the backfield quickly, Alabama's offense is going to have a tough time scoring points. Not to mention they brought in Tyler Bruckner from Notre Dame. And, and Nick Saban's the greatest college football coach of all time. I don't think there's any denying that now. So you can trust him to put the best players on the field. And if he's looking at you in the eye and telling you Jalen Murrow is their best quarterback in that quarterback room right now, uh, Alabama's in trouble for this year. Uh, of course, they're, they're Alabama. Like you said, they recruit with the best of them. They have a number one recruiting class. They're ultra talented. And they could still come out of the West. They could still win 10 games this season. But it's just very hard to see them uh, returning to what they once were in 2020, 2019, 2018. Uh, I just don't think that's Alabama this year. Yeah, no, definitely not this year. But I don't think that they're falling off Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. for – the next couple seasons to come. Mm -hmm. I don't see that happening. And also, I think part of them coming out the West this year is just because the SEC East and West both are, aren't what we've, you know, been accustomed to seeing in the last decade. You know, a, a lot of these teams, you know, LSU just had a bad loss to Florida State. And, you know, Florida State's a team that I see being in the college football playoffs this year, but still LSU did not look – they didn't live up to the hype in that week one game. Same thing with a couple other teams. I know, okay, I'm going to go ahead and start getting into it. Tennessee against Austin P. Tennessee is not going to be a threat in the college football playoffs this year. And and that's a fact. That's a fact. With uh, the way Joe Milton has been playing week one and week two, we cannot expect to bring Georgia in at Neyland Stadium and, and beat Georgia. It is not going to happen against an elite defense when – we Josh Heupel at the beginning of the game for uh, for Tennessee against Austin P was trying to give Joe Milton some confidence. He was trying to give him some easy deep throws, you know, some posts, some digs, twenty yards down the field. He was trying to get him some confidence to let his arm go, and he was missing on all these throws, mm -hmm. all these throws. And then, not to mention, the receivers could not yeah. catch a cold in the winter. They could not catch COVID in twenty twenty. I mean, I mean, for real, it was that bad out there. It was that bad out there. This is against Austin P. The size differential is, is absolutely absurd, and and we're having uh, trouble moving the ball because we can't throw it and catch it. That's the most basic thing. You, you, you do that on the playground. Yeah. When when you're seven years old, you throw and you catch the ball. You do that when you're out there with, with your pops or with your brother. You know, and and you're in the front yard. You're throwing and catching the ball. If these guys are on scholarship and cannot get this done against Austin P, going to have no chance against Georgia. And I'm not even looking at the Florida game. We're going to beat Florida. And that's what I was talking about. The SEC is just trash this year. Our Florida's been in the dumps for a while. <laughs> so I'm not worried about the Florida game. But with this Josh Heupel team, the standard has been set. You know what I'm saying? Like the fans are expecting – for us only to get better. You know, we're, we're supposed to follow the trajectory of Georgia when they got Kirby Smart. That's the expectation for Tennessee. But with that, we need uh, the best quarterback on the field, you know, similar to what you were saying with Alabama. And I'm not I'm not calling for this, but I know fans in two, three weeks of Joe Milton playing like crap. If he plays like crap against Florida, they must just go ahead and start saying it, that we need to put Nico in. You know, Nico yeah. – obviously the five-star quarterback from California, the biggest uh, recruit Tennessee's had in a decade, they're going to start calling for that. And whenever there's pressure of a starting quarterback who's already lacking confidence uh, of the backup coming in, if he's not able to shake that off and go play like he doesn't care if he's going to make a mistake, he's going to be playing scared and timid, and that's just going to make it even worse. Yeah. If you're scared to pull the trigger and you're, and you're hesitant, you're done. You're done. And right now, that's not even the problem with Joe. He's sitting back in the pocket, cool, calm, and collected, and then you, he airs it out 60 yards down the field, and it's over and behind the receiver by six yards. That's not good. When you're, it's not, it's not the nerves. He's cool and calm in there, and still making bad throws. I, I don't know what it is. I know that he had insane expectations this year because of how Anthony Richardson was, 
you know, from Florida, and they got the same build, and Joe Milton has an absolute cannon, and he's a raw talent, but this talent has to be cultivated. He's like 24, 25 years old. This is his sixth year. He's not some young, you know, 19, 20, 21-year-old kid. Yeah, and, you know, fortunately for Tennessee, you play Virginia and Austin P. These are throws that Joe Milton can miss and get away with it, but obviously when you get, and Tennessee has a tough stretch of games this year before they even get to Georgia, um, you know, Florida coming up, Texas A&M, Alabama, um, the, in those games, Joe Milton can't miss those throws. He absolutely cannot. Uh, Tennessee's offense, what makes Tennessee's offense so great um, in previous years under Hidden Hooker, uh, not, not only was their running game really, really good, but Hidden Hooker, when they got the opportunities to, to make the plays deep, he, he would connect on them. And I'm not saying you're going to hit on them 100% of the time, but it, it just almost feels like I, this is the first time I feel like I can say Joe Milton just almost has too much of an arm. I, I, I never thought I would say that uh, about a quarterback, but it's just true. And it's not even just the, the deep 50-yard passes that he's overthrowing. There were plenty of times in that Tennessee game I saw him receivers in the end zone, you know, 20 yards uh, down the field. And uh, Joe Milton just has to have a little bit of touch, but he throws a laser beam. And it's just hard to, to be accurate when you're throwing that fast. He's got to be able to develop some touch. Now, moving forward to the, yeah. whole, the, the whole Nico thing, it, it's hard to, to make that decision as a coach. And this is why these coaches get paid a lot of, a lot of money. Uh, as talented as Nico is, and he could be a really, 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 really good quarterback uh, down the road, it's hard to put your season in the hands of a true freshman. Um, very rarely you see freshmen starting at quarterback. But at the same time, you made a really great point, Aiden. You don't, if your starting quarterback is playing scared, especially in the SEC, you're, you're done. You're, you're going to lose games that way. So if it's pretty evident that Joe Milton can't shake this thing off, uh, Nico's going to have to come in, and I think Josh Heupel's going to have to make that move. Because I'd rather have a freshman at that point starting for me uh, than a, a veteran that's scared to make a mistake. Yeah, yeah. It, see, it's a tough situation because personally, I, I don't want to see Nico come in just because, like you said, he is a true freshman. But if you know as a coaching staff that you don't have a chance to win the SEC and go to the playoffs this year, would it be better to start the freshman and, and have him get, go ahead and get five, six games of starting experience, knowing that y'all aren't y'all might not win all five or six of those games, but going into next year, he's going to be exponentially better than if that was his first year starting, mm -hmm. first game. You know what I'm saying? But also on the flip side of that, if you don't think that Nico is mature enough to be able to not play well and shake it off, because, you know, that can have a big effect on a quarterback psyche if his first three games in – He's playing terrible. He might never get over that, you know, as a college quarterback. We see it all the time. Like, look at Kay Klubnik against Charleston Southern. He looked abysmal in the first half. I didn't watch the second half. They ended up blowing him out. But terrible, terrible reads. And it's almost because, like, they, they, they're playing bad for a series, and then it's two series, and then it's three series. And then they feel like they got to dig themselves out of this hole by making an insane Caleb Williams-type highlight play instead of just continuing to play inside of themselves. And then they go and make another mistake. And then it's almost like, dang, maybe I'm just like, maybe these guys are all better than me. Maybe I'm not, you know, this ain't high school anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how some of these guys start thinking as a quarterback whenever you're a young guy playing. So Hypo is going to know what type of guy Nico's in. You know, he's been in there since the, uh, before the bowl game last year against Clemson. You know, he was an early graduate from high school, early enrollee into the University of Tennessee. So, he knows the type of guy Nico is, and obviously if Nico was significantly better than Joe, he'd already be starting. You know, I prefer to just, you know, lean on the side of just having the fifth, six-year guy starting. He's a leader on the team. These guys are going to rally to him, you know, win, lose, or draw. But, um, yeah, it's definitely alarming seeing Joe Milton how, playing how he's playing. I'm not, you know, saying he's playing good by any means. He is not playing good, missing wide-open throws. They're going to have to play better for sure if they, if they want to win. Well, that's going to be it for this video, guys. As always, thank you for watching. If you haven't already, please leave a thumbs up on the video. Subscribe and hit the notification bell. That would be greatly appreciated. Um, we got a couple preview predictions coming out for the next week. Um, we have a couple SEC conference matchups that we're going to be touching on. So be on the lookout for those in the next coming days. Um, if you have any comments or questions, uh, leave it down below in the comment section. We'll definitely get to reading it. But that's going to be it, guys. Have a good day.